It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're doing well. I am feeling a whole lot better than I was just a few days ago. It has been an interesting week over here to say the least, but I'm glad to be standing up again and feeling much better than I was. And I hope to see you this coming Sunday, if at all possible. We plan on getting together for worship at 9 and also at 11 with the Bible class in between at 10. And so if you're a member of the congregation, we would really appreciate it if you could sign up using the Sign Up Genius account from one of the two worship services. We don't need to sign up for class in the middle. And as always, guests are always welcome. But I'm looking forward to seeing you again, if the Lord wills, this coming Sunday morning. Uh, tonight, we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, is basically a history book. It is the history of the early church written by Luke who was described by Paul as being the beloved physician. And so he's some kind of a medical doctor and he is a, a great historian and he's good at recording things and getting things in the right order. And Luke, of course, writes the book of Acts, but he also writes the book of Luke. And Luke is a history of the life of Jesus, kind of a, a telling of his life, one of the four gospel accounts. And then after that, he moves into volume two, which is the book of Acts. And that is the history of the early church. And he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, both books. Uh, Luke and Acts are written to the same man, and he's giving this man uh, what he needs to know, perhaps to obey the gospel or maybe to increase his faith. Uh, up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first 13 chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we had the Ascension. We had the beginning of the church. The man who couldn't walk was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. We had the first deacons, but always with a question mark in Acts 6. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, who was described as being the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch's response to Philip's question, do you understand what you're reading? And of course, the eunuch replies, how can I, or how could I, unless someone guides me? Translations differ on that, but you get the point there, how can I? In Acts 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, you may remember the Lord identifies himself to Saul by saying, I am Jesus. So that's our summary for chapter 9. In chapter 10, we had the journey to Joppa as Cornelia sends messengers looking for Peter. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles, as Peter explains the baptism of Cornelius to the Jews back in Jerusalem. In Acts 12, we had Peter liberated again. And over the past two weeks, we've looked at Acts 13, where we had missionaries sent out. And they were sent out from Antioch. They go over to Cyprus from one end of the island to the other. And then as they go north to the region of Pamphylia up in Asia Minor or Galatia, as we would describe it, uh, John Mark bails on the team somewhere on that journey, uh, heading home to Jerusalem. They land in Perga up north there, and then they go to Antioch of Pisidia, the second Antioch in the book of Acts. Uh, in Antioch, you may remember Paul is invited to speak in the synagogue, which he does. And the rest of Acts 13 is basically a record of Paul's sermon in the synagogue in Antioch. Most people were receptive there in that town, but the religious leaders were jealous and basically get some key groups fired up and run Paul and his companions out of that city. And that's where we left it last week. Paul and his people are leaving Antioch and they are heading on down the road. And since we have the map on the screen here, uh, I'll just go ahead and let you know that when they leave Antioch, notice they head to Iconium <clears throat> and then over to Lystra and then to Derby, and then they pretty much turn around and retrace their steps back out of that area before getting on a ship and going back home to Antioch of Syria. So this is where we're headed tonight. I know the lines are a little bit uh, bubble-like. These are not actual road maps. This is kind of a concept of the cities that they visited, so not the exact trail that they were taking. Um, so a little bit exaggerated there with the large green arrows, but they come in, they make their rounds almost in a hook shape, coming around to Derby, and then they back their way out. So that's kind of our, our outline for class tonight. And this, by the way, uh, takes a period of a little bit less than three years. And so that's kind of our timeline here. We may get into the timing a little bit more next week and explain some of that. But roughly a, a three-year journey here from the time they leave Antioch of Syria, go all the way to Derby, do a U-turn, and come back. Roughly three-year period. So tonight, though, as Paul is run out of Antioch, he and his team now head over to Iconium. And so we pick up tonight then with Acts 14. And I'll go ahead and let you know that in the ABCs of Acts, the summary of chapter 14 is not gods, but men. Not gods, but men. Years ago, one of our good Christian sisters here at Four Lakes suggested never give up teaching. 
never give up teaching. And that would be a, a great summary of this chapter. I know I'm still going with not gods, but men. That's what I grew up with. I think that's the way I'll always remember this chapter. But if you want to go with never give up teaching, um, I will still love you as my Christian family. And if you want to, to break from tradition there, that's fine. And it's a great summary, as we'll see as we progress through this chapter. So not gods, but men, or never give up teaching, if you want to go with that one. But our first paragraph tonight is Acts 14. As you can see here, we're looking at verses 1 through 7. So Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore they spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra and Derbe, and the surrounding region, and there they continued to preach the gospel. You'll notice in the first part of this paragraph, we find that Paul and his people have established a fairly reliable pattern here. As they enter a new city, notice they first go to the synagogue of the Jews. And of course, later in Romans 1.16, Paul will go on to say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of, of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so as God originally intended, Paul starts with the Jews and then he moves on from there as he can. And in Iconium, as in Antioch, he has some early success among the Jewish people. They believe, at least a number of them do. But by preaching in the synagogue, he also reaches some Greeks. And we don't really have much of an explanation here. I'm assuming these are either Greek-speaking Jews or perhaps locals who are interested enough in Judaism to come to the synagogue to listen. So proselytes of some kind or perhaps straight-up Jews who uh, simply speak Greek, and that's the way that they were known. So I'm not sure where to land on that one, but that's kind of those are kind of the two main theories there, but some Jews and Greeks in the synagogue. But in keeping with the pattern of the opposition, those Jews who refused to believe, notice they stirred things up, and uh, they turned the minds of the crowds against them. So there is a conflict. The conflict is brewing. Uh, this is the kind of conflict that the old Paul, or Saul, would have really been proud of accomplishing, right? This is the man that he was. He used to do things like this. And so they're now doing exactly what Paul himself would have done just a few years earlier. And I'm kind of wondering, as Paul is preaching, as he can see things brewing, he's probably thinking to himself, yep, that's, that's exactly what I would do if I were in their situation. I don't know, but uh, I know he's speaking from experience here. Uh, Paul, though, notice he continues preaching. Only now he is described as speaking boldly <clears throat> with reliance upon the Lord. We also find here that Paul and his companions are performing signs and wonders. And we find the reminder here that these amazing things are actually being done by God through them. So they're not the ones taking the credit here. They are not actually doing these things personally through their own power. But God is working through them. God is granting this power to Paul and his companions. <clears throat> In the next part of this first paragraph, we find a distinct division taking place. Some come down on the side of the Jews, but others side with the apostles. And at first I was a bit surprised by the plural form of the word apostles here in verse 4. Uh, in my mind, as far as I know, Paul is the only apostle apostle on this trip until we realize that Barnabas is described as an apostle in at least some sense. And the reference actually comes just a little bit later in this chapter. And uh, if you skip down to verse 14, you can see it. Uh, but we need to remember the word apostle simply means messenger. And so in my mind then we have, the way I would describe it or the way I envision this, capital A apostles, that would be the original 12 plus Matthias who replaces Judas and then Paul. But then we also have a number of what I would describe as almost being lowercase apostles, uh, lowercase a, uh, in the generic sense of that word. We might think of the difference between a deacon, a man who serves having met several very specific criteria, qualifications, and so on, 
But then we also have kind of the idea of a lowercase deacon, a servant, as that word is translated, what that word actually means. So I hope that makes sense then. Uh, again, we're going to find in a few verses that Barnabas is an apostle, but I would look at that as kind of a lower A apostle as opposed to uh, one of the big 12 plus Matthias plus Paul. Uh, but the point here is there is a division among the people, almost exactly as it happened in Antioch. And it's interesting to note that the good news has a way of dividing people, doesn't it? I know we look at division in the world, especially in the religious world, and we think, well, it's a terrible thing. And I know, I understand it is. God wants us to be united. And yet at the same time, we also need to realize that even back in the first century, the preaching of God's truth had a way of dividing people. Um, we don't blame the gospel, though, do we? We don't say, well, look at that terrible thing that, that the gospel has done. That's not it. And so we hear the word of God, and at that point, we face a choice. What do we do about it? We can accept it, we can obey it, or we can reject it. We can turn away from it. And at that moment, a division has taken place. Certainly, we remember what Jesus said over in Matthew 10, 34 through 36. Do not think that I came to be, bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. And this is certainly what we see happening in Iconium. Jesus has divided the city. Paul has preached the gospel, and people are starting to take sides on it. Well, that division quickly progresses to the point where those on the other side make plans to stone Paul and his people to death. Uh, stoning was their method of capital punishment, and this kind of reminds us that the persecution at this point was not at the hands of the Roman government yet. We aren't even to that point. The persecution in the first half of Acts, we would say, uh, very accurately falls on the Jewish people. They are the instigators of this. So uh, stoning is their method of capital punishment, unlike crucifixion, uh, as would have been practiced by the Romans. Uh, they learn about this, though. They get wind of this plot, and they leave. And again, there is no dishonor in leaving. If we can escape persecution in that way, there, there's no problem. If we can get out of there uh, to preach another day, feel free to, to book it and, and go. And so they head out to the cities of Lyconia. I think that's kind of a name of the region. And uh, Lystra and Derby is where they go, those two villages, and then also the surrounding area where they continue to preach the gospel. So they don't quit. They don't go home. They don't just go hide somewhere for the next 10 years or whatever, but they move and they keep on preaching as they go. Uh, this, by the way, is what Jesus commanded, uh, having gone or as you are going into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. And that is exactly what they're doing. As I understand it, the command and what we know as the Great Commission is not to go. In English, it looks like go into all the world. It looks like the command is to go. Uh, but in the original language, it sounds like the, uh, the command is to make disciples. So as you are going into all the world, make disciples of all nations by baptizing them and so on. So in this case, the going was motivated by persecution. And I would just remind us that Paul did some of this motivation himself, didn't he, before he switched sides. And I know we've noted that a number of times over the past several weeks, but it's rather ironic uh, that Paul caused much of the growth of the early church uh, by not intending to do that, but intending to persecute the people they ran and they preached the gospel on their way. <clears throat> So let's continue tonight with Acts 14, verses 8 through 18. This is the next paragraph. So Acts 14, verses 8 through 18. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, 
men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. In verse 8, we have a little more info concerning what happens in Lystra. They meet a man who cannot walk. He has no strength in his feet. Uh, Dr. Luke tells us that he's had this condition from birth and has never walked. So this is not psychosomatic. This is not something he's imagining that um, Paul just kind of encourages him to, you know, snap out of it. That's not what's going on here. This is from birth. He had never walked. And this man is there and he is listening to the Apostle Paul. So he's not actively begging, at least at this point. We have no record of that. But he is listening. He's interested in what he's hearing. Well, Paul connects with the man. They make eye contact. And Paul somehow knows that he has some level of faith. Paul can read his audience. And Paul simply orders the man to stand up. And that's what he does. I was kind of looking at this uh, earlier today. And uh, the word ortho is used there. So like orthopedic or something. So stand upright on your feet. And so the man does that. He jumps up and he begins to walk immediately. So we have a miraculous healing. And as we move into what happens next... Uh, let's remember that the purpose of miracles is to confirm the Word of God. We'll learn more about this in the opening verses of Hebrews 2. Uh, the Word of God was first confirmed by miraculous signs, and this is what we see here. you got some stranger coming in to preach something. He kind of needs to do something to prove who he is and that his word is valid. And that, that was the point of miracles back in the first century, before they had the written word confirmed, written down. Uh, this miracle has... Uh, caused the local people to assume that Paul and Barnabas are gods. And so I guess we might say in one sense, mission accomplished, right? That they were messengers of God, that the miracle did its job by pointing to deity. Uh, but in another sense, the people obviously went a bit too far here, didn't they? They, they see Paul and Barnabas as gods. They are the gods that, that have come down to earth and they're amazed by this. And what I've always found interesting here is that they saw Barnabas as being Zeus, the chief god, and they see Paul as being his messenger, Hermes, because Paul was doing the talking. And I mean, obviously, Paul as an apostle apostle outranks Barnabas, uh, but they see Barnabas, the quiet one over to the side as being Zeus, and Paul is actually doing the speaking, so he must be the messenger of the chief god. And they're so convinced, in fact, that the local priest of Zeus brings out oxen and garlands as he gets ready to offer a sacrifice. And uh, these people are completely, absolutely convinced in every way that Barnabas and Paul are gods. We actually have a lot of archaeological evidence from this area about their indeed being a temple to Zeus right outside the city. I think we found coinage from this actual city with, a, I think, a, a priest of Zeus leading out two oxen. Uh, toward the sacrifice. And so there's some uh, archaeology certainly to back this up. In verse 14, we get back to both Barnabas and Paul being referred to as apostles. Uh, when they hear that this local priest is getting ready to offer a sacrifice in their honor, they are absolutely horrified, aren't they? Now, I would contrast this with uh, what happened with Herod uh, just uh, in the last few weeks here. Remember, Herod was praised, the voice of a god and not of man. And he, his response was basically, thank you very much. And he accepted that praise. But here, uh, Paul and Barnabas do the opposite of that. So they are horrified by this. They tear their robes. They run out into the crowd, begging everybody to stop. And the reason is they are not gods, but men. That, of course, is our summary for this chapter. We are not gods. We are men just like all of you are. And I know many people might have taken advantage of this. Many people might have accepted that praise. Sure, we'll take an oxen, we'll head out of town and having enriched ourselves or whatever, but Paul and Barnabas do not do that. They beg the people to stop what they are doing. I didn't have a chance to look it up. I kind of forgot to look it up before we started recording this class tonight. But I think the, the reaction of Paul and Barnabas here to this praise is very similar to Peter's reaction, if you remember, when Cornelius greeted him, as I remember it very faintly, Cornelius, didn't Cornelius bow down 
And again, I'll have to look that again, look that up again. But as I remember, Peter, nope, get up. I'm, I'm just like you kind of thing. So uh, don't quote me on that. We'll have to look that up again and kind of confirm that. But it seems like a, a little bit of a parallel uh, here between Paul and Barnabas and the people of the city. And then also what happens when Cornelius bows down or pays some kind of honor to Peter. Don't. I'm just a, a servant of God like you. Um, however, <clears throat> they then take this as an opportunity to preach the gospel. And in this case, um, as they start preaching the gospel, they, they point out that the gospel means turning from these vain things to a living God. And so unlike Zeus, God is the living God. He is not a dead God. He is not a statue made out of something. Uh, he is not just a, a legend or something that's been passed down from our forefathers by, in terms of stories that are made up. Uh, also, the one and true only God is our creator. Uh, notice the gospel seems to include an understanding that God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And that's a relevant message today. We need to hear this. This world did not happen by chance. This world did not create itself. This world and everything in it did not spontaneously come from nothing. We've had science disprove that that's possible, haven't we? But God created all of it. It is miraculously created by our Father. Uh, otherwise, we don't have Adam and Eve. Um, if God didn't create everything, uh, we don't have the first sin as described in Genesis. We don't have the prophecy of Jesus crushing the serpent's head, getting his heel crushed, and, and on and on and on. A lot of what we believe goes back to those first 11 chapters in Genesis. They are not myth. They are not superstition, but it's what actually happened. So Paul then doesn't concede to their worldview, say, oh, well, it's unimportant where you think everything came from, nothing like that. Uh, but he denies that everything goes back to Zeus and the other so-called gods. But he explains that the one true living God actually created everything. In addition to the creation, Paul also reminds them that God didn't just create us and leave us on our own. So that's a theory a lot of people have these days. God was back there somewhere and he did some things and now he's gone. He doesn't really care about us anymore. Kind of wound the world up and left it there like a, like a clock on the mantle. That's not the case. But notice Paul points out here that he blesses us continually. He gives us what we need. He sends the rain. He provides us with food and, and so on. At the end, uh, Luke lets us know that even by saying these things, Paul just barely restrains the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. It would have been so easy to take advantage of that, but Paul does not. And I would note in the last town, they almost sacrificed Paul himself, didn't they? But here they are trying to offer sacrifices to Paul and the others. A huge difference between these two cities, at least at this point. And I say at this point, because of what happens next. So let's continue tonight with Acts 14, verses 19 through 23. Acts 14, verses 19 through 23. <clears throat> but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Luke doesn't remind us here, but let's remember that all of this happens at Lystra, this account right here. It's in Lystra, they heal the man who can't walk. It's in Lystra, the people try to worship Paul and Barnabas with a sacrifice. Uh, this, though, is where we come to the but. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. These people were following Paul along the way. It wasn't enough to personally turn away from the gospel in their own city, but they leave their homes and they chase Paul down, winning over the crowds, even to the point of stoning Paul, dragging him out of the city, and leaving him there, supposing him to be dead. And this is happening, uh, as this is happening, large rocks, as large rocks are hitting him in the head and the upper body. I, I wonder whether Paul is thinking about Stephen here. 
you can't help but make that connection. Remember, as a younger man, Paul held the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. So, so Saul, as a young man, was a witness to the stoning of Stephen. If, if not just a witness, he might have been more of a coordinator, certainly an enabler, uh, allowing them to do what they were doing. And here, a number of years later, I'm wondering whether Paul makes the connection here as those rocks are hitting him and his head and around his body, if, if he's thinking, this this is what I did, this is what I did to Stephen. I just can't help but wonder that whenever I look at this passage. I would also note the text does not tell us that Paul actually dies here. Uh, some have seen a miracle in this passage, but that seems to be reading a little bit too much into it. They threw rocks at Paul until they thought that he was dead, supposing him to be dead, and then they leave him there. Uh, if Paul had been actually dead, uh, I think Luke probably would have told us that here. That would have been a good place to point that out and to emphasize the miracle that happens, but we don't see an indication of that. They throw rocks, he's unconscious, they, they assume that he's dead, he's in a, he looks to be dead, and so they just drop him there and they leave. But I hope we can picture this. Paul is laying there by the side of the road, probably in a puddle of his own blood. He's, he's injured to the point where the people who did this think that he's dead. That was their purpose. Their, their goal here was to put him to death. They think mission accomplished. But the disciples, after this is all over, the disciples come in and they stand around him. And as they do, Paul gets up to his feet. And what does he do? He enters the city. Paul is no quitter. I would emphasize the difference between being surrounded by your Christian family can make. What a difference that makes. What an encouragement those people would have been to him in that situation. Uh, I read one man's commentary on this passage who imagined retracing Paul's bloody footprints to that site or that spot outside the city where you could have found the actual spot where Paul was left for dead. You could see the spot in the dirt where they left him. But if you had looked around, you probably could have also seen that circle of footprints uh, around him in a circle uh, left by Paul's friends. And that author's question at the end of his article was, when's the last time your feet were in a circle like that? And I think that's a very good point to make here. That's a very good question. Uh, thinking about the good that we can do by standing around and encouraging somebody in whatever way that they need. Before we move on from this, can we imagine what Paul might have looked like physically at this point? He would look like something that stepped right out of some kind of horror movie today. I mean, blood all over his clothing, um, the possibility of broken bones, uh, teeth broken out. Can you imagine the violence of killing somebody by throwing rocks at them until they die? I mean, it is hard for us today to imagine the brutality of stoning. Uh, we do have an interesting reference in one of Paul's letters at the end of Galatians. In the next to the last verse, this is what Paul says. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. In other words, as I understand that passage, just by looking at Paul, you could tell that he'd been through quite a bit, even after the fact, even a number of years later. I think you could look at Paul and you could say, man, that guy has been abused. That, that man has been through some things. Again, scars, uh, you know, missing teeth, jaw out of alignment, a dip in his skull. I mean, I don't know, walking with a limp, legs that didn't work quite right, arms that were bent in weird ways, having healed. I don't know. Um, but Paul basically concludes the book of Galatians by saying, look at me and accept what I'm saying in this letter. Don't make my life any more difficult than it already is. I've already been through so much, so and it's obvious by looking at me. That's kind of my paraphrase of the last uh, little part of Galatians there. So it was obvious physically by looking at Paul uh, that he had been abused for the Lord's sake, the brand marks of Jesus, and certainly a good chunk of that goes back to what happens here. Uh, we'll get to this in a few weeks, but when Paul goes on his second missionary journey and passes through this area, he picks up a young disciple from Lystra, a young man by the name of Timothy. Timothy was from Lystra. Timothy then jumps on board. He travels with Paul from that point on and becomes a valuable member of the team. But I mention this because what happens here might have had a huge impact on this young man. I like to imagine that Timothy was perhaps in that group of disciples who uh, 
gathered around Paul's seemingly lifeless body. They were there for basically a funeral. They were paying their respects, as I understand it. But then they saw him get up and go right back to preaching. And in my mind, Timothy either sees this for himself or absolutely he hears about it and was motivated by it. And it must have had just a huge impact on this young man's life, enough to where Timothy decides to join up with Paul on future journeys. I want to follow a leader like that. I want to do what that man is doing. Um, by the way, when Paul writes Timothy a number of years later, toward the end of his life, uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12, to Timothy, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so years later, Paul would use this experience to remind Timothy that those who are faithful will be persecuted. After Lystra, Paul continues on to Derby. <clears throat> if you remember from the map, Derby is where they turn around. It's kind of at the end of that hook. Um, so they go to Derby, they preach, they make disciples just as Jesus commanded. Then they do a U-turn, they turn back, they go back through Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. And uh, their mission on their way back out is to strengthen the souls of the disciples and to encourage them to continue in the faith. And that's a good reminder for us that it is possible to not continue in the faith, right? Uh, there are many in the religious world today who teach falsely that uh, those who are truly saved can never be lost. We don't find that in the scriptures. But we find there that Paul is encouraging these people to continue in the faith. And so they are in the faith. But he is encouraging them to continue in it. If falling away were truly impossible, Paul would have never said this. This doesn't make sense if it's impossible to ever fall away. But as it is, new Christians do need to be encouraged to continue. New Christians need to be strengthened. And so the question for us at the Four Lakes Congregation and for wherever you're joining us from, the question is, are we doing this? Have you made a point of encouraging a new Christian lately? I would encourage all of us to look through the church directory, make a point of looking for those we haven't seen for a while, and then make a call or send a text or a message of some kind or show up at their house. If we don't encourage like Paul did, then we're failing to do what we need to do based on what we've learned from the book of Acts. This book needs to change us. If this book isn't changing us, we're wasting our time. And I think one thing we learned from this passage is Paul not only taught people the gospel, but he also followed up. And he went back and he checked on people and he encouraged them to remain faithful. And that is absolutely something that we can still do today. At the end of this paragraph, we find that as Paul leaves the area, as he makes these visits on his way out, he and his team appoint elders for them in every city. And what's amazing here is that this all happens within a period of about three years. Have we thought about that? He comes in. He teaches and preaches to these people for the very first time. And on his way back home, within a period of about three years, he appoints some of these people as elders of the congregations. What does that tell us? It tells us it is possible to be qualified to serve as an elder within a relatively short period of time. How is this possible? How can somebody be qualified to serve as an elder in only three years? We're not given the details here, but it happens. And my personal opinion as to how it happens is that some of these men were most likely already faithful Jews, that they already knew about God. They already knew the law of Moses. Once they obey the gospel, then they're very quickly brought up to speed. They are mature men with wisdom and experience leading people, and once they make the leap from Judaism into Christianity, they are ready to go. Do we see how that might work? I think that's encouraging to us that Paul can teach a bunch of people and can appoint some of those men elders within a three-year period. That, that's an amazing thing. And to me, it's just encouraging. It's easy for us to picture an elder as a 60-year-old man who's been a Christian for 70 years, okay? <laughs> That's an impossible scenario, isn't it? But I, I, sometimes in our minds, we think impossible things. This is not achievable. 
and yet it is. I mean, Paul does say that an elder is not to be a new convert over in 1 Timothy 3, verse 6, but apparently three years is enough time to no longer be considered a new convert. Otherwise, Paul contradicts himself here, and he does something that he said not to do later, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, I would also note the role of prayer and fasting in this process. This is serious business, and they treated it seriously. They went to God in prayer. They skipped meals over this, and it was significant. This was a huge leap in the history of the Lord's Church in this region. I would also note that they appoint elders for them in every city. God's plan is for each local congregation to be overseen by a plurality of elders. So we don't have a, a pastor uh, leading a congregation on his own. He's not the leader. We don't see that anywhere in Scripture. We don't have a bishop serving over multiple congregations. We see it in the religious world today, don't we? Uh, it's become a problem starting almost from the very beginning where uh, local elders kind of got promoted to serving over other congregations, and eventually you have bishops and cardinals, and then you got a pope over the worldwide church, and it just, it mushrooms, it just goes from there. Uh, but we never find one elder over a congregation, but instead elders are always in scripture referred to as a group. And we certainly see God's wisdom in this. The church is not a dictatorship, uh, but some of the older wise men uh, who have experience in the scriptures are tasked with meeting those qualifications, being recognized, appointed by the church, and then going about leading the congregation. Uh, the main lesson I get from this little section is that these churches did not languish for decades without leadership. They didn't go for 10, 20, 30, 40 years without elders, but instead uh, men were qualified and they were appointed rather quickly with God's approval. We continue with Acts 14, 24 through 28. Acts 14, 24 through 28. They passed through Pisidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. So basically, they retraced their steps back to the Mediterranean Sea, but instead of going back through Cyprus as they arrived through Cyprus, instead of going back through Cyprus, they instead sailed directly over to Antioch, back to the city where they started this journey. And when they get there, notice they report. They gather the church together. They give an update. They report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And that's a good practice. When a church sends someone or sends a group of people on a mission, those missionaries need to give updates. Just yesterday, I sent out our monthly um, activity report, and I know most of our members should get this, just a one-page summary. And I started this way back in May or June of 1993, and I don't think I've missed a single month since then. But back in the spring of 93, the church down in Goodlettsville, Tennessee, took on half of our financial support. And we were cutting it close, just a few months from moving to Wisconsin, and the church was unable to support us. They only had 19 people that first uh, that first Sunday, and, and they couldn't afford to support a full-time preacher. And so a few months before moving up to Wisconsin, we visited with the elders and the, the, some of the deacons, the missions group from Goodlettsville, and they interviewed both of us, took about two hours, and they just grilled us. They had some good questions, but some of their questions made us feel better about what they believed. If you understand what I'm saying there, you can tell a lot about an eldership by the questions that they ask. And so they set us at ease with some of their questions, but at the end, they said, how much do you need? And we had the figure. We were basing our salary on the teacher salary schedule from back in 1993 in Janesville, Wisconsin, and it, it was half of a first your teacher salary. It was $1,127 a month. And that's what I said to the elders. We need $1,127 a month. And they looked at each other and they said, okay, uh, we'll do that. And if, if you're familiar with churches and their supportive missions, that, that is a huge figure for uh, one congregation to take on exactly half of a family's support on the mission field. But that's what they did. And um, and in return, I wrote a brief one-page report every month summarizing what we did during the previous month along with the attendance and contribution figures. 
And uh, thankfully, we were able to cut down on that support through the years. But when we moved up here to Madison, there was a need again. And and the church wasn't in a position to support us full time. And so we went back to the church in Goodlettsville and asked them and we explained the situation. And they said, yes, we will do whatever needs to be done. And we continued those monthly reports since then, back in April of 2000. And, and since we've we've cut out all of our personal support altogether, thankfully, um, the church here at Four Lakes has taken up all of our financial support uh, just a few years ago. But uh, I still send out those monthly reports to those churches that used to support us financially, as well as to former members and really to anybody who's interested in the growth and the health of this congregation. And I send these to you as well. And I do this to keep you informed and also so you know what I'm telling others about the work here. And I've seen terrible examples from the mission field where missionaries send a report back and when the locals hear about it, they're like, what in the world is he talking about? And so I send these reports to you and to them and to really anybody who's interested in keeping up with the church. I've transitioned from more of a letter to a newsletter and now primarily to pictures. And you know, my, my report has a lot of pictures in it. And uh, I figure I'm following the golden rule. When I read something from somebody on the mission field, I want to see some pictures. I want to see things. That's how I think. And so that's the way I try to communicate with others. But anyway, this is my way of reporting. And I say that because this is what Paul does here. It is important to keep people informed. If somebody is supporting you in a good work, if they're praying for you, they need to know what's going on. And uh, this is one way of doing it. At the end, we find Paul and his people spend a long time with the disciples. Uh, they apparently took some time to fellowship and also to recover from what they'd been through. And I'm thankful for the church in Goodlesville to this day. Um, all during the years that they supported us on the mission field, we were supported by the elders. I knew I could call the elders at any moment down there at a time when our congregation did not have elders. I could call and I could say, hey, this is what we're facing. I've never, never been this way before. What's going on here? What do I do? Kind of getting some advice. And, uh, and they came and visited us in Janesville and also in Madison a number of times. And we were so thankful for that good relationship. But that's what's going on here. Um, Paul is invited back and he stays there for quite a time. And that brings us to the end of Acts 14. Not gods, but men. Or never give up teaching. I think the more I look at this chapter, uh, never give up teaching may be more accurate than the other. I don't know. Both are good. Uh, but this also brings us to the end of Paul's first missionary journey. So next week then, let's pick up with Acts 15. We'll come to some conflict in the early church, um, and we'll deal with that, and we'll see how they dealt with it. So thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you on Sunday, if at all possible. I uh, got a negative COVID test this morning. Took the test on Monday, and I had... <laughs> I had probably 90% of the symptoms, and uh, I'm, I'm so thankful it came back negative, and I'm feeling a lot better. But I hope to see you on Sunday, if possible, and then also between the services at 10. So worship at 9 or 11, the Bible class in the middle at 10. And uh, let me know if you have something we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth and everything that we see around us. You are the God of good news, the God who saves us. Tonight we've seen that you are also a God who heals. You are concerned about us. You know our suffering. You know our fears. You know our concerns. You sent your Son to this earth on a mission to save and to forgive. And you've sent your messengers into all the world to communicate your love to all people. Thank you, Father, for saving us. And thank you for making us a part of your plan to go into all the world. Help us as we encourage each other to continue in the faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen.